Thank you. You're very kind, Ilaria. And I'd like to congratulate the first panel. It was really excellent. And welcome participants to our second panel. So I really feel like the, the first panel has done a really great job of helping us to understand more about the, the current status of the gig economy, especially in the region of Southeast Asia. Um, it really is a complex storyline that Uma set out at, at the beginning. Um, so we, we have to understand that, uh, as Uma reminds us, the dynamics of work have really been revolutionized uh, since the spread of the platform economy. And um, I mean, anyway, I'm not surprised by the optimism that Alaria mentioned um, coming from the first panel, because it really does seem as if this gig economy is here to stay. So we might as well embrace the opportunity and move forward in, in a positive manner. But uh, really, the changes have come so rapidly that we're now in a circumstance where, where we have governments and traditional sectors trying to grapple to keep up. And with the ultimate aim being to create now a sort of equilibrium on how the supply and the demand of labor meets in a framework of, of digital platforms and fixing this in a way so that the roles and regulations um, can catch up and hopefully propel platform work in a way that maximizes the well-being of societies on all fronts. So we, we, we continue to have a framework where there's a lot of conflicting stakeholders um, in the egg ecosystem of the gig economy. So you have uh, on the one hand gig workers who want to maximize their earnings. You have consumers that want to maximize the affordability of the services. You have platform companies that want to maximize profits. And so really, it's these sort of stakeholders that we want to, to concentrate on in the second panel, which is much smaller than the first panel. Um, we unfortunately don't have so much time. We have 20 minutes to, to discuss. Um, so let me be quiet and now introduce, reintroduce our second panel. Uh, Ilaria gave us an introduction at the, at the, in, in the initiative to who, who is joining us in the second panel. We have again, um, um, Yu Hang, and we have also an additional panelist who's Professor Aslan. And Professor Aslan is a great addition because he's representing the voice of the government. He's working in the uh, Economic Advisory Council for Malaysia, and he's also a very distinguished professor with a very wonderful CV that Ilaria shared with us. So I'm going to first start by asking Professor Aslan. Uh, so Professor Aslan, can you give me your general impression, please, of the conversation so far? Have you have you heard anything in the in the in the first panel, the first session that surprised you? Over to you, please. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting programs and ILO to organize this uh, conversation. I've been uh, listening very attentively from the beginning, from the first speaker, and go to the session one and so on. You know, I'm trying to position myself. I think you rightly said it, and I was about to say that. I'm probably the first to come out here and say that I'm coming from the government side. I mean, is this something that you welcome? Is this something that, uh, what does it mean in terms of a nation? Uh, whenever you start to see a new creations of the so-called job opportunities. I, I think from most of the members, uh, I think largely many are coming from the providers themselves. I mean, the platform owners and also people who are seeing, I mean, on the, the great opportunity that is open. I, I, I can't agree more to say that uh, innovation is always good. I mean, uh, we keep on seeing, uh, you know, an expansion of opportunities, I think, for, for the workers as well as for the, for the businesses. Those, those are all well, well lining up. But my, my, my things that I've yet to hear much, probably I'm the one who is able to do it, is how do the government say it? I mean, uh, this is a challenge. I think for one thing that uh, from my perspective, I'm, I'm very careful about the role of government in dealing with all this. In, in many cases, sometimes uh, government is so much known about coming in and stalling progress. You know, in many cases, I mean, the bureaucrats coming in and jumping with a lot of uh, new rules and regulations 
as how they see things. So now my role, I, I'm kind of a kind of a hybrid myself. I'm an academic. I mean, I'm also now in the Economic Action Council. Uh, I must say that uh, the attention to gig uh, economy is so much uh, in Malaysia, uh, probably, I mean, due to the pandemic. I mean, it was there before. We know that. I mean, but you have not seen it like what we are seeing now. I mean, you go on the street, you see green and pink uh, on the street. I mean, kind of uh, 24 hours a day, kind of. You know, I, I, so it's good. I mean, uh, to me, I, I will not make much comment. I agree with all the opportunities and so on. But I, I, I would like to say that because we were discussing this in the context of, especially to start with in Southeast Asia, I, I, I believe that there is a contextual aspect to this. So how a government are looking at this and how to make sure that it is in line with what the, the nation is progressing is very important. And uh, let, let me give a case of Malaysia. Yes, uh, out of the pandemic, we are glad to see that uh, many youngsters are now uh, involving in this. But we are also having a serious concern about whether is this kind of a job for the future. I mean, it, as, as what we are seeing now is very much a very low end uh, kind of gig workers. I mean, we love gigs, but we, we feel like uh, if truly that is good to fit Malaysia, we like to see that uh, more of a high end kind of uh, gig workers that give a high, I mean, a better payment and, and so on. But when we start to see, like in, in one simple survey that we did, uh, about 47% uh, of the so-called the gig workers in the form of riders and so on, uh, those with uh, uh, diploma, those with, uh, with a degree and so on. I mean, wonder whether is it really out of what one of the speakers was saying that uh, to flex, uh, to find something flexy so that you can get a better living or is it that because you couldn't get anything else? So those are problems. And we start to see that things are being pushed. In Malaysia, uh, high employment among youth, high unemployment among uh, graduates of the colleges, the universities, it is a serious issue in Malaysia. And at the same time, we have huge influx of foreign workforce in the country that, that push out and crowd out those at the low end. So again, I, I'm surprised to see that a very small percentage of people with uh, a lower end uh, qualification that I suppose I thought that they should be the one there. But surprisingly, you see, again, they are crowding out uh, again. So the problem that we are facing is still there. So the challenge is how to do it right, how to make sure that gig is really in line with what the country want and how to make sure that uh, all those uh, segments are being, I mean, entertained in terms of what they want. I mean, the business side, the worker side, the consumer side, as well as the government. Yeah, that's really perfect. And I think you've, you've really hit the nail on the head when you talk about we're, we're just at the beginning of this conversation. Yeah. Um, and it's so important to have all stakeholders in the room when we are talking on when we are having this conversation. And when we talk about the, you know, the quality of gig work and um, I mean, you can often think of it in terms of what type of work do you want for your children? This is, it's, it's a very interesting yeah. issue. Do you want your children to be the gig workers or do you want them still to be the doctors of tomorrow? And, and if you don't want your children to take up gig work, then who do we expect to do this work? So there's really are a lot of trade-offs that still need to be dealt with and it's a very evolving conversation. So let's bring in uh, Yu Hang here. Um, when, when we talk about these um, these trade-offs, and I think we, we heard in the ILO reports uh, and, and in the discussion in the first panel that, uh, you know, the gig economy still doesn't always work, run smoothly. And you mentioned this yourself as well, that the one area of concern remains about the conditions of work for the gig workers in terms of the long hours, sometimes dangerous conditions. Um, unfortunately, we were unable to get a, a gig worker here um, but we thought it would be wonderful if you can help us to understand as uh, the managing director of the CRAB, what you see as some of the most frequent areas of complaints uh, from, from your CRAB drivers 
and share with us as well how Grab Management is trying to to deal with these these complaints. Thank you. Got it. I I, I think that maybe I'll I'll preface it by saying that one, the people on the platform are incredibly diverse, right? You can imagine someone who is looking at this as a main source of income, um, maybe with a bit of a lower education, sees this very differently from someone who is in transition and thinking about it as a three month job, but sort of trying to take that time to think about the next career move. And so the, um, the, the concerns are very, um, very different, right? Um, on our end, the way we think about it is we need to ensure some fundamentals are managed, right? First, um, safety. Um, they all they are always concerned about and because it's 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 flexible work. You can work as little as you want, but you could also work way more than you you should, right? And and we have put in place with technology some guide real guards to make sure that we continue to make sure that it's safe, right? For example, we 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 do driver fatigue uh, monitoring. We have telematics. Um, you know, we, we, we make sure that they don't, they don't drive too much. We suggest that they, that they rest and there's a lot more to be done. There's a lot more investment in technology that we can do um, and we need to continue to do that, right? So safety for us is almost um, the number one thing we, we need to always get, right? And then on top of that, you have things like, you know, inclusiveness and non-discrimination, right? Where we want to make sure that as many people can use our platform as well as make livelihood out of it. We're talking about, for example, people with disability. Um, and then there's a couple more things, right? One is transparency between drivers and platform, right? I think we need to not we need to be honest to drivers about what gig work can and cannot do. Um, is it a career path that goes, you know, different steps along the way? Probably not, but can it provide you with certain income? Can it be a stepping stone? Can it allow you flexibility? Yes, it can. And I think that transparency of what it is, but also transparency of the condition of the work and be very clear I think that's um, really important. Um, we are also thinking about the voice of the voice of the gig workers. Um, how do we hear them? We found that we found that kind of the traditional way of unionization is one avenue, but because the gig workforce is so complex and diverse, we find that that's inadequate. That we need to have a lot more channels um, in terms of engaging, listening, and and, and understanding what they need, right? And, and finally, I'll talk about this topic about income, which is always a big topic, right? And, and that goes back to the, 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 the comments where, where are some of the trade-offs? I, I think for us in the middle of, of, of this gig economy, we need to manage the affordability of our service for consumers. We need to ensure we don't want to maximize our profit, but we need to ensure the sustainability of the platform because without the platform, we can't serve. And so we need to be responsible for investors like Pandu to make sure that they get proper returns of investment so that they can continue to invest and, and take risks on, on this. And the, the next thing is how do we ensure that, that we don't leave the outcome to how much so we don't solve the maths by saying, this is how much we can charge. This is how much investors should earn. Therefore, this is how much gig workers can earn, right? It shouldn't be an outcome, but it should be something where we need to commit to, to say, this is how much we think is reasonable if the gig worker puts in the right effort should earn, right? And, and today as, as Grab, we, we have the task to try to manage these different things. It's not an easy job, but it's our job and we want to not do this alone. We need to work with government because governments bring with them larger considerations beyond just the gig economy and can, can really help us guide and also regulate us. We, we, our, our position is we believe government needs to regulate the gig economy. Um, it needs to regulate it correctly, but it needs to regulate us and we're happy to be regulated. Um, and we're also happy to shift, shift this trade off from where it is today to where we think it needs to be if it's going to be a feature of the economy for the next 50, 100 years. So it's a long answer, but I think, again, early stages, very complex, 
Um, but but I think government has a has an important role for us as well. I think you are absolutely right, and I'm sure the professor as I would would agree. Um, there has to be a role for government, and there will be a role for government. Uh, so uh, let's let's turn it back to our government representative, Mr. Aslan, Professor Aslan. Um, so you've heard a bit about the some of the tensions. Yeah. We know we know there's still a lot of tensions in terms of how to regulate um, the platforms and working with the platforms to make sure that regulation makes sense and benefits consumers, benefits the workers, uh, benefits the traditional economy uh, players. So from your perspective, how, how do you think the government can get involved and in, in, in to allay some of these tensions? No, I, think, I think first of all that government must accept the fact that uh, this is going to stay, it's going to be there, whether you like it or not, it's going to be there. And uh, there will be some evolutions to it. I mean, though I try to envision that probably as we move on, we will see be seeing a different kind of gig economy. At the moment, in, in many cases, when people talk about gig economy, I mean, gig workers uh, in a very plain layman term, is they are looking at the e-healers. I mean, the one who, who are, you know, using their bikes and using their cars and so on. But actually, I, I, I believe that as we progress, uh, we will be seeing a lot more. There will be a gig professors probably one day. There will be a gig uh, doctors. There will be a lot of gig architects and so on. You know, I mean, uh, that part of giving that freedom and opportunities for a, a person to, to modify, the kind of adjust and accommodate uh, working and living, I think that, that's fantastic. But uh, again, I, I think uh, as this is kind of a very initial conversation, uh, because I've been interacting with a lot of, uh, you know, platform uh, kind of uh, owners in Malaysia as well. Uh, and I, I, my, my concern is the role of government. How does government comes in? I mean, yes, glad to hear that. I think everybody believe that at the end of it, we need some form of regulations, some form of thing to govern us. Because there are so many parties involved here. But uh, the, the approach of government is very important. If you jump in, I'm sorry to say, I mean, I, I've seen government jumping in and try to carve out the rules, I mean, from their own personal perspective. I mean, the own, uh, th that could be a disaster sometimes. You know, uh, let me share with you, for example, like in Malaysia, uh, we see Ministry of Transportation comes in, uh, Ministry of uh, Human Resource comes in, Ministry of Information and uh, and Multimedia comes in and everybody kind of feeling like uh, I have something here that I need to regulate. So what we are worried is that if they work in isolations, I mean, if, if, if there's not enough engagement with, uh, with the providers, with the players, I think we might end up uh, stalling progress. So my perspective is that uh, we need to sit down together. There should be a common... Uh, open discussion and understanding how things works and to be fair to all. I mean, you want to be fair to the government, you want to be fair to the consumers, you want to be fair to the workers. I mean, a lot of issues being raised in terms of their safety, in terms of their social security, in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, the rights and so on. Those those are also important. And, and definitely, I, I, I subscribe to the idea that whatever that we do, we do not want to stall the progress. You know, we want, we want to find a way so that we can encourage more innovation, more innovative ideas in terms of uh, to expand this further. And, uh, and, and again, even classification wise, uh, is it, yet to be certain, how do you classify this? In, in Malaysia, when you talk about informal economy, general, generally it refers to, to, to kind of a roadside kind of, you know, all those people who are selling cakes and so on along, along the road. So, so how do we classify this? I think those are important and I, I really hope that uh, we will be able to put things together. Uh, we, we seriously need the cooperations of the players themselves, I mean, to be involved with us and sitting together. And well, at the end of it, everybody get a cake. Everybody, uh, I mean, I, I like uh, uh, Andrian mentioned that at the end of it, we must make sure that everybody happy. You know, I mean, happiness is and above all, at the end of it, the well-being is better. I mean, everyone everyone is happy. I mean, you know, 
uh, so it's, it's a very simple word, but that, that's the ultimate of it at the end of it. And I think it's 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 important. You reminded us that a lot of governments in this region are grappling with this issue of platform economy on top of the their, their difficulty already in dealing with what was existing in the informal economy. I mean, we have rampant informal economy. Now we have a platform economy, which in a way exacerbates or grows the informal economy even bigger. So if the governments were already struggling to deal with informal economy, now we have this additional layer. But we will get there. I do believe we will get there. And it's through tripartism and this, these sorts of dialogues that involve all of the partners that, that, will, that will get us there. Now, unfortunately, we are short on time. So I'm going to ask one additional question. I'll start with you, Professor Aslan. So this is about the future. Now, if you were to look into your crystal ball, Mm. And let us uh, think about how you see the platform economy evolving in the Southeast Asian region over the next 20 years. Do you, how, what do you think? Do you think it will continue to grow? What will, what will the workforce look like? And um, what, how, yeah, how, how will this workforce be looked after? Yeah. Just. I just completed a study looking uh, for Malaysia, looking into what's next after the pandemic. Very much of our focus is on the pandemic. Uh, I start to put the idea that there will be a major change in the landscape of the economy of the future. With respect to the gig, I think broadly I will stay like this. I think what is informal today will be the formal tomorrow. And I think it will be a major shift. There will be a lot of changes in the future. The government, uh, the, the consumers at large, the workers, I mean, talents, the kids that we are attending schools today, I mean, uh, the business owners. Honestly, I, every, this is a tsunami of things. But I hope that it can be turned into a good tsunami, you know, and, and we want to make sure that it, it at the end of it, uh, adding to the welfare of human beings good for the planet and good for everyone. And I, I seriously believe that this will stay and this will flourish. Uh, we need to be attentive in looking at it. And uh, again, I mean, coming from government, I, I, I really, really urge all government to look at it seriously. Do not rush into uh, putting in uh, rules and regulations, engage, engage, and, and engage. Right. Right, that's exciting. I mean, I think I, I love your optimism and it is an exciting time and we will be seeing some changes very, very quickly as, as governments spend. Well, not too quickly, as you mentioned. So, oh, Yuhang, what do you think? What, what do you think uh, the future for the gig work will look like? Um, well, I, I think um, um, for, for me, the we haven't really seen the the evolution. I mean, the story has not yet been fully written. Right. In fact, I think we are kind of in Act One of, of a long play, and so I think, in terms of sort of government and role of government, one I don't envy that because it's a very very difficult job, and and I think part of the responsibility of us as a platform is to explain explain what gig work is better and more. With governments, I, I think that's that's number one because I think there is going to be a lot more that comes. Um, so for me, there's there's three keywords. Right, one is regulate, which we talk about about how governments need to regulate gig work and understand gig work to to regulate it. And I think again, ILO with its work on really getting the details and the richness of it, it's critical to this um, process. So regulation and appropriate regulation. But I think what often is missing is also this think about partnership and innovation, right? Partnering with, with, with platforms such as ours, partnering with, with um, unions, with worker representations. I think we can find things in which we can innovate with and learn. Um, you know, in the tech world, we have this approach of agile, right? Where you, you try something, it doesn't work. You, you pivot, you try something new, you learn, you improve. Um, it, it's something that we find it's quite hard to do with governments because because they want to kind of set a regulatory regime and keep it there for five years, 10 years. But I, I think when it comes to tech, which is evolving so fast with so much benefits, but also risks, um, it's good to innovate, find sandboxes, um, learn from it, 
and then regulate based on learnings um, of that. And we've seen examples in Southeast Asia where that's actually happening quite a bit. And and I, I think we should uh, we should do a lot more. So so I think that yet yeah, the best to be lots to do. And I I I, I just want we are we're very very willing. To fact yet, but we are also um, very careful to unleash to ensure that the, um, for part of this, um, I mean, it's a great time to be doing gig economy at this time. It is. I echo your enthusiasm and your optimism. And I'm. It, the conversation is. It's such a fascinating conversation, and we're still at the very beginning of this conversation. So I will, with with great thanks to the to the two panelists. Um, unfortunately, we will close. We are out of time. The conversation will certainly continue on regulation and many other issues that are of importance too, as we continue to see the evolution of the platform economy. Let me turn it back over to Ilaria to Thank close you, us out. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.